The Hiberno-Saxon style, also called insular from insula, the Latin term for island, referring to the British Isles, is the name given to the interaction of two groups, the Irish, or Hibernians, and the Anglo-Saxons of southern England in the 7th century. This was a pagan art and a perfect example of medieval art as being strongly informed by European native art and decorative tradition, as the two ethnic groups who created this syncretic style, the Celts and the Germanic Anglo-Saxons, were animistic pagans. Both the Celtic, meaning the Irish and the Pictish, and Anglo-Saxon elites had long traditions of metalwork of the highest quality. Much of it was used for the personal adornment of elite men and women. The insular style specifically arose from the meeting of these two styles in a Christian context, and with some awareness of the late antique style of Rome. This can be seen especially in the way that they decorated a very new object, the book, which was new to both traditions. The Anglo-Saxons had no tradition of painting or calligraphy, but excelled in metalwork. The rich gold and jeweled examples that survive show their love of metallic brilliance and bright color. Across all the islands, society was pretty much entirely rural. Buildings were very rudimentary. There was no such thing as an insular style in architecture. It's clear that, although there were definitely similar objects that have not survived made in more perishable materials, both the religious and secular patrons expected objects of dazzling virtuosity, which were probably made to be that dazzling because they stood out even more, in a rustic environment with little artistic sophistication. The insular style is most famous for its highly dense, intricate and imaginative decoration, which takes elements from several earlier native styles. Late Iron Age Celtic art gave the love of spirals, triskels, circles, and other geometric motifs. These were combined with animal forms, probably mainly deriving from the Germanic version of the general Eurasian animal style, though also from Celtic art, where heads at the end of scrolls were common. Interlace was also used by both these traditions, as well as Roman art, and other possible influences such as Coptic art which are said to have also traveled through Mediterranean art, and its use was here taken to new levels. A key third influence of Hiberno-Saxon art that is important to highlight was Mediterranean art. After St. Augustine's mission arrived from Rome with many manuscripts and other art objects to use in converting the Saxons to Christianity, it became an important ingredient. This tradition brought with it the representation of the human figure, such as representations of Mary and Jesus in classical style. It's important to understand that figurative representation, as in the human figure, was almost non-existent or very rare in this native art. So with Christianity and Christian subjects and themes, they took the style from antique art and tried to imitate it as best they could. Some sources distinguish between a wider period between the 5th and 11th centuries, from the departure of the Romans to the beginnings of the Romanesque style and a more specific phase, from the 6th to the 9th centuries, between the conversion to Christianity and the Viking settlements. Large stone crosses are also a place to view Hiberno-Saxon art. They first appeared in the 8th century in Ireland, apparently later than the earliest Anglo-Saxon crosses. The largest crosses have many figures and scenes on all surfaces, from both the Old and New Testaments, usually with a crucifixion at the center of the cross. Even early Anglo-Saxon examples mix vine scroll decoration of continental origin with interlace patterns, and in later ones the former type becomes the norm, just as in the manuscripts. The stone monuments, erected by the Picts of Scotland between the 6th and 8th centuries, are also very striking in design and construction, carved in the typical Easter Ross style, which is related to that of insular art, though with a lot less classical influence. In particular, the forms of animals are often very related to those found in insular manuscripts, where they typically represent the evangelist symbols, which may indicate a Pictish origin for those forms. The carvings come from both pagan and early Christian periods. The purpose and meaning of the stones are only partially understood, although some think that they served as personal memorials, the symbols indicating membership of clans, lineages, or kindreds, and depict ancient ceremonies and rituals. Does this remind you of the runestones of Viking art?
The Book of Kells, the Lindisfarne Gospels, and the Book of Duro are the three most well-known illuminated manuscripts. The importance of lettering became urgent since they were creating the perfect design to communicate the written word of the Bible. An Irish Latin Psalter of the early 7th century, perhaps the oldest known Irish manuscript of any kind, is the Cathach of St. Columba. The decoration influences the shape of the letters, and various decorative forms are mixed in a very unclassical way. Lines are already inclined to spiral, as you can see. The earliest painted insular manuscript to survive was produced in Lindisfarne in 650. It introduces interlace and also uses Celtic motifs drawn from metalwork. All these qualities are beautifully exemplified by the Book of Kells, a copy of the Four Gospels in southeastern Ireland, between 769 and 820. Its creation began on the island of Iona in a monastery founded in the 6th century, and after a possible Viking raid, the book was moved to Kells for safekeeping. The text has been identified to have three different hands at work, but with a high degree of consistency throughout. The book survives nearly intact, but the decoration is not finished, with some parts in outline only. It is far more comprehensively decorated than any previous manuscript in any tradition with every page except two having many small decorated letters. Human figures are more numerous than before, though closely surrounded and engulfed by decoration, which is as crowded as on the initial pages. A few scenes, such as the temptation and arrest of Christ, are included, as well as a Madonna and child surrounded by angels, the earliest Madonna in a Western book. You can see in this magnificent Cairo symbol in the Book of Kells a creative initial with a human head at the top, twisted to form the letter. The earliest surviving gospel book with a full program of decoration, though not all of it has survived, is the Book of Duro. It has six carpet pages and many full-page miniatures of the four evangelist symbols. Its date and place of origin remain subjects of debate, but it was made around 650 to 690, either in Duro in Ireland, Iona, or Lindisfarne. The influences on the decoration are also highly controversial, especially regarding Coptic or other Near Eastern influence, which is a big debate in art history. The origins of the overall format of the carpet page have often been related to Roman floor mosaics, Coptic carpets, and manuscript paintings, some pages use Germanic interlaced animal ornament, whilst others use the full repertoire of Celtic geometric spirals. Each page uses a different and coherent set of decorative motifs. Only four colors are used, but the viewer is hardly conscious of any limitation from this. All the elements of insular manuscript style are already in place. The execution, though of high quality, is not as refined as in the best later books, nor is the scale of detail as small. Produced in Lindisfarne between about 690 and 721, this is a gospel book in the style of the Book of Duro, but more elaborate and complex. There are four evangelist portraits, clearly derived from the classical tradition, but treated without any sense of depth. Other less well-known manuscripts also exist, such as the Litchfield Gospels, and another distinctive but less widely known insular type of book is the Pocket Gospel Book. Naturally, it's way less decorated, but there are many with evangelist portraits and other decoration. You may think that the Hiberno-Saxon style is only interesting accidentally, but its force in creating the wider traditions of medieval art is huge. It didn't simply die in obscurity in the British Isles. Like many barbarian syncretic art styles during the medieval age, it was incorporated into the wider traditions of medieval art, specifically by being brought back to the European continent by Irish and Saxon Christian missionaries, where it had a strong influence particularly on the art of the Carolingian Empire.
although Carolingian art was also focused on copying the Imperial Roman and Byzantine styles. Some examples of this influence that showed up in Carolingian art were the large initials and much more abstract decoration than what can be seen in the classical models. These features continue in Ottonian and contemporary French illumination and metalwork, before the Romanesque period further let go of all classical restraints, especially in manuscripts and in the capitals of columns. This sort of influence is something that even in art history we often miss and neglect to highlight the importance of, because of the bias towards classical influence being supreme, and a clear line from the classical through medieval to Renaissance art and beyond. But the exchange of different types of peoples, newly Christianized, and the art and culture that they brought had a huge effect on European art. It's been said that the barely controllable energy of insular decoration became a feature of later medieval art, especially the Gothic art. It's also noticeable that these characteristics are always rather more pronounced in the north of Europe than the south. Italian art, even in the Gothic period, always retains a certain classical clarity and form. Sadly, the finest period of the style was brought to an end by the disruption of monastic centers and aristocratic life caused by the Viking raids, which began in the late 8th century. These are presumed to have interrupted work on the Book of Kells. No later gospel books are as heavily or finely illuminated as the masterpieces of the 8th century. In England, the style merged into Anglo-Saxon art around 900, while in Ireland, the style continued until the 12th century, when it merged into Romanesque art. Christianity had until now been understood as a phenomenon existing in the context of the Greco-Roman world. But missionaries like St. Patrick brought something different, his mission to Ireland to spread the gospel was to all people, and was the first to see it as his moral duty to go outside the empire to convert the heathen peoples. It was a new effort to try to introduce a religion organized around towns, dependent on the proclamation of the word of God in its original Greek or Latin translation, into a tribal society which had no towns and which knew neither Greek nor Latin. In fact, literacy was introduced to them through the foreign languages of Greek and Latin, because of this lack of an urban context, the missionaries needed a different institutional framework than in the Roman world. This different framework was monasticism. Monasticism had developed in the Roman world, but there it served as a retreat from the world. The church itself was run by a secular clergy that was independent from the monasteries. In England and in the rest of the barbarian north, this was different. Monasteries were the central institution, bases for missionary activity, centers for basic education in Latin, for book production, for the training of clergy, and for cultural and economic life. Under the sponsorship of Pope Gregory the Great, missionaries were sent to southern England to spread Roman Christianity. St. Augustine arrived in England in 597, establishing himself in Canterbury, which would become the traditional home of Christianity in England. His successors sent missionaries to the north, principally to Northumbria, to convert the Angles and the Saxons. This led to the dispute between the two forms of Christianity, the Irish tradition from Patrick and the Roman tradition from St. Augustine. In northern monasteries like Lindisfarne in southwestern Scotland, there was a complex mixture of Irish and Roman traditions. In both lands, but especially in Ireland, the clerical and secular elites were often very closely linked some Irish abbacies were held for generations among a small kin group. Ireland was divided into very small kingdoms, almost too many for historians to keep track of, whilst in Britain there was a smaller number of generally larger kingdoms. A critical issue when it came to spreading Christianity abroad was how the missionaries would respond to the indigenous traditions it encountered in the north. This excerpt from Bede's History of the English Church and People records a letter sent by Pope Gregory the Great to an abbot when he departed for Britain in 601. 